And when we come to this great chapter in the Bible, uh, it, the theme here is on biblical stewardship and giving. And I've mentioned before that our theme for the month of February on Sunday evenings, I'll be preaching on the subject of stewardship and just trying to encourage our church family uh, in the matter of, of faithfulness and consistency and liberality when it comes to our giving. And the Lord has blessed our church in, in, in so many ways down through the years. And uh, every once in a while I'll have the opportunity to have breakfast or lunch with Pastor Calvin Fuller. And uh, I'll always ask him questions. Tell me a little bit about how this happened back in that day. And tell, us, tell me a little bit about how the church got to this property or built this or did this. And uh, he'll give me a little insight of how the Lord worked. And it's always honoring, giving honor to God and not to men. But uh, the Lord is good, and His mercies are everlasting. And God's provision in our lives and for the ministry of this church uh, is, has, has been faithful. And because of the faithfulness of God's people. And the Bible has much to say on the subject of giving. As I've said before, uh, many pastors try to sidestep the issue altogether. But if you and I could ever grasp the, 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 the fact that of, of the ownership of God and the stewardship of men, you and I, and the lordship of Christ, if we could ever get a hold of those three things, it would change the way we live our Christian life. If we believe the ownership of God, that God owns it all, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills underneath the cattle. And, and, and any cow that tries to raise his hoof against a man of God, God will put him in his place. Amen. <laughs> uh, God is the owner. He is the owner. Ownership. You and I are stewards of God's blessings. Uh, we will give an account of how we've used, how we've invested what we have for eternity, for souls, for the work of God in this place. And you and I need to understand the Lordship of Christ, the fact that He's Lord of our lives. And, and so it leads me to the subject tonight of giving God's way, is my thought tonight. Giving God's way. How can we be assured that when we give, that we are giving the way God would have us to give? Giving as unto the Lord. And uh, so let's read some verses and I'll give you just a few thoughts tonight. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, but he's using as an illustration, as an object lesson. He's reminding them uh, of what the churches in Mac Macedonia did. And uh, nothing wrong with that. And uh, sometimes all of us need to look in other places and see what God is doing. And that can be an encouragement to us, right? Uh, you heard about the, <laughs> I hate to say this, but you heard about the, uh, uh, the farmer. His, his hens were not laying enough eggs like they used to. So he goes over to the ostrich farm and rolls back this big ostrich egg and rolls it into the hen house. And he says to the hens, I just want you to see what they're doing in other places. <laughs> well, that'll, you'll get that tomorrow by, by freight. But <laughs> and sometimes we need to see what God is doing in other places. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's not necessarily scolding them, but he's just trying to, a little, a little bit of uh, encouragement by, by looking at the churches of Macedonia. And notice the pattern here. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and, and, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, and I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of, to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus that 
as he had begun, so would he finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. In other words, Paul is trying to encourage them here that, you know, giving, grace giving, and is just, just as much a part of the Christian life as, as these other things, as our faith and utterance and knowledge and diligence. Uh, Paul says, abound in this area of your life as you're abounding in other areas. Uh, Paul said in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. By the way, let me stop and say, Paul starts off with a, an illustration looking at the church of Macedonia. And then Paul uses a greater pattern. He turns to Jesus. Amen. Uh, he starts off with the church of Macedonia. And he says, there's a greater example here through what Christ did for us. And uh, ye know the grace of our Lord. When he was rich, yet he became poor for your sakes that we might be rich. Here and I give my advice. Here's Paul. He's giving his advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward or to, or to make a promise to do a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. In other words, Paul said, what you set out to do a year ago, do it. Get busy. Do it. Uh, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that, to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and you be burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, uh, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. And so I'm speaking tonight on the subject of giving God's way. And uh, one of the major ministries of the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey was involving this relief offering to the churches, to the poor Christians there in Judea. And, uh, and Paul was willing uh, uh, to, he had not forgotten the old beatitude, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that, that kind of guided Paul's uh, missionary mindset. And this offering that also was an evidence to the Jewish believers uh, which many of them were still zealous about the law and, and Moses, it was an evidence to them that Paul was not an enemy to the Jews or to Moses. And uh, early in Paul's ministry, uh, Paul made a commitment to remembering the poor. Um, there's a verse in Galatians that talks about that. Galatians chapter 2, I think it's verse 9 or 10. Uh, verse 10. Paul says, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. In other words, which he purposed to do. So Paul, through his ministry, was, was not forgetting those that had needs. And uh, he's encouraging the church, churches of God here to be generous in meeting the needs that arise. And Paul hoped that the generosity of the Gentiles here uh, would silence the jealousy of the Jews. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the Corinthian church was not doing their part. And that's what Paul is addressing here. He's trying to, to, to give his advice, as you see in verse 10, uh, to show the necessity. Notice he uses the word expedient. That word expedient means necessary. When Jesus told his disciples, it's expedient for you that I go away. Uh, that word means necessary. It's necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. But when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So same word is used here. And Paul says it's expedient. It's necessary for you that what you've begun before and what you've purposed to do, that word forward, purposed to do, uh, he said now it's time to, to perform the doing of it. 
And uh, you've got, you had a readiness of will, Paul said, but now we need to see the performance of that which you have, the doing of it. And that's what Paul is encouraging the, the, the Corinthian Christians here to do, to take their part. Now, like many people, they made promises, but they failed to follow up with their promises. And the Bible tells us in, in verse number 10, it's been an entire year that they've wasted. Uh, notice the Bible says for this uh, before a year ago. Notice Paul is talking about something that they should have done a year ago. And so he's talking to them about their responsibility and that they'd wasted. Why, why such a serious delay? I thought about this as I read it recently. I thought, why, why the delay? Why, why, if there was a readiness of mind, if there was uh, uh, the wherewithal to, 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 to meet the needs, why the delay? And here's what my conclusion is. When a church is not spiritual, as the Corinthian church wasn't, when a church is not spiritual, it cannot be generous. When a church is not spiritual, it will not be a generous church. And Paul is, is connecting here uh, our, the generosity with spirituality. And it's a wonderful thing when Christian people, not just the churches at Corinth, but churches everywhere, enter into the idea, and we really believe that it, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's a scriptural thing, and that's something we ought to practice, all of us. Now I want to give you some thoughts tonight, just on the subject of stewardship, and how can we tell if we're giving God's way, if we're giving in the right way, the right spirit with the right motive. Let me give you just four statements to write down. Uh, when we give in spite of circumstances, we are giving God's way, we're pleasing God, when we give in spite of circumstances. Now notice the verse I read a moment ago. Uh, the circumstances were not ripe here for these churches in Macedonia to give. As a matter of fact, when you look at verse, verse number 2, we see some words in the same sentence that really don't belong together. Uh, we see words like affliction and abundance. Uh, and we see uh, great affliction and we see the abundance of joy. Now those two things are usually on the opposite spectrums. Abundance of affliction and abundance of joy. Usually those two things don't go together. Here's something else in the verse. Deep poverty and riches of liberality. Usually those things, you can, how can you be in deep poverty and also be rich at the same time? Do you see it? And there's a paradox there, but we see that this church gave in spite of circumstances. They were faithful. Uh, as a matter of fact, they had to overcome these problems to be faithful in their giving. And the, for one word there is great affliction. Think about that. Great affliction. Paul's ministry was characterized by affliction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 3. I don't have time to read all the verses. My time is getting away from me. But the affliction of, the, of these churches, of this church, did not affect their giving. As we learned this morning in our Sunday school lesson on adversity. Adversity builds mature Christians. I mean, believe that. Say amen. Affliction builds mature Christians. Affliction, when it comes into our life, drives us to the feet of Jesus. It causes us to look beyond ourselves and to look at only what the Lord Jesus can do. It causes us to look to heaven for answers and not within ourselves. And I believe that the greatest times of blessing in the Christian life can come from the greatest times of suffering and affliction. I wouldn't trade today what I went through at the age of 40 and 41 for anything that I've experienced in my Christian life because it brought me closer to the Lord. God did something when I had cancer in my life that, that, I, that could not have been done unless I had went through that trial. 
And many of you are thinking right now of things in your life that you've went through, afflictions, sufferings, problems, trials, maybe something right now you're going through, that when you look back on it down the road, you'll look back and be able to say, God used that in my life to build me, to make me stronger. And God comforted me during that time so that I may be able to comfort the others who have the same affliction. 1 Corinthians tells us, chapter 10. And so we give in spite of, this church gave in spite of their circumstances. One circumstance was they were under great affliction. And usually, now listen, usually when difficulty comes, the first thing we stop doing is giving as Christians. Some people say, well, well Pastor, I just, when, when everything gets right, when everything can be calculated, then I'll make a commitment to the church. Well, listen, everything's not going to be just right all your life. Uh, we can't wait for everything to be just right before we start doing right. Do you follow me? We can't wait till everything is just right before we start doing right. We have to do right in spite of circumstances. If someone were to come to me and say, well, we're going to get married. Well, wonderful. We're engaged. Well, God bless you. When you get married. Well, we're not going to get married till everything's just right. <laughs> well, listen, it's going to, things are going to be wrong all through your marriage, you know. And everything's not going to be just right. You're going to have problems when you get married. When are we going to start having kids? Well, when we got enough money to have kids. i got news for you. You're never going to have enough money to have kids. <laughs> Let's go ahead and have them and let God take care of you, right? God will provide. And uh, amen. But they had to overcome great affliction. And then deep poverty. Deep poverty. This is more than just being poor. This is extreme destitution, poverty. And... You know, the average Christian uh, in a state like this can become so uh, obsessed with their situation that they forget about others. And that's what happens so many times. When things get tight financially, what do we do? Well, we start cutting back on eating out. We start cutting back on clothes and cutting back on furniture and cutting back on vacations and cutting back on, on uh, cars and is that what we do? No. Usually that's not what happens. Usually when things get tight financially the first thing that people cut is giving. They cut giving and tithes and offerings. But here's something I've learned. The first thing we cut in our budget during a financial crisis is the thing that we give the lowest priority to. That's what that says to us. We're saying that this is the thing that we can do without. So let's, let's stop doing that. Do you follow me? When the truth of the matter is, we can do without fast foods, restaurants, right? We can do without a $5 cup of coffee at Starbucks. Somebody say amen. We can do without longer vacations and better cars. And I'm saying that what we cut is lets us know, it, it reveals to us our priorities. But the thing we ought to ask ourselves is, can we do without the blessing of God? Can we do without that? And I say, dear friend, I'd rather have the blessing of God knowing that I'm obeying His Word and I'm giving faithfully, I'm giving cheerfully as unto the Lord. So here's a church that uh, that had to, in, in spite of circumstances, I mean, they had to overcome some great affliction, they had to overcome deep poverty in order uh, to give God's way. And then, notice the, their circumstances didn't hinder them from giving. In fact, they gave more joyfully and more liberally. And uh, that's, a, that's a great pattern here. So, first of all, when we give in spite of our circumstances. Number two, when we give enthusiastically when we give enthusiastically or joyfully if you're taking notes that's a shorter word to write down <laughs> joyfully you know it's possible to give generously but not give joy joyfully you know that it's possible to give generously but not to give joyfully what's the bible say over the next next page 
The Bible says on the, over the next page, chapter 9, verse 6. I preached on this last Sunday night. He which soweth sparingly shall so reap sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall so reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, cheerfully. And so here's a church that gave in spite of circumstances, they gave joyfully, enthusiastically. Uh, I heard a preacher say one time, you ought to give until it hurts. <laughs> uh, then one of the church members came up to him afterwards and said, well, it just hurts me to think about giving. <laughs> but here's something that caught my attention as I read this and studied this week on this particular subject. Here's a church that begged to give. They told Paul, let us have a part in this. Let us give. Notice the wording of Scripture here. Verse 4, praying, with, praying us with much entreaty. In other words, they were saying, this is our responsibility. Uh, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They were praying, they were begging to be included. Well, how many times have you heard a Christian beg to take an offering? <laughs> Here were Christians saying, let us, let us give. We're, let us entreat, entreat ourselves to give. Let us bear the responsibility. Let us enter in. Let us take upon us and enter into the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And then notice what the Bible says in verse 5. Look at it. And this they what? Did. Here's a church that put their money where their mouth was. <laughs> you ever heard that say? Put your money where your mouth is? That's probably not a good thing to say in church. It usually has to do with betting and gambling. But here's a church that stepped out with their mouth first and then put the money behind what they said. And they gave enthusiastically. They wanted to have a part. You know, this is the kind of giving that that honors God. Amen. Grace this giving. And it not only frees us from our sins, but this kind of giving frees us from ourselves. And that's, that's the real issue. The grace of God will not only open your heart, but the grace of God will open your hand. And uh, our, giving, our giving shouldn't be the result of some cold calcu calculation if trying to figure out how it's all going to work out. But our giving should be a warm-hearted celebration, a jubilation, joyfulness. And uh, all of us have to work. Listen, all of us have to work on that. All of us do. Turning loose of something that we think we need, but honoring God by doing so. So here's a church that God blessed because uh, they gave in spite of their circumstances. They gave enthusiastically. When you and I, number three, when we give as Jesus gave. When we give as Jesus gave. Notice Christ Jesus is the preeminent example. So Paul runs a little bit higher than looking at the church, and he goes higher than that. He takes a higher road and says, let's don't look at the church anymore. Let's look at Christ. Let's look at Christ. He's the example. Who... Well, though he was, he was rich, yet for your sex became poor, that ye through his poverty that we might be rich. He's the preeminent example. We follow him. He's our example in service. He's our example in suffering. He's our example in sacrifice. He's our example in stewardship, the Lord Jesus. Remember, he said, I came to do the will of the Father. He looked at himself as a steward. Am I pleasing? Uh, John 8, 29. For I do always those things that please Him, Jesus said. I'm saying today, when we give as Jesus gave, how did Jesus give? Well, he first of all, He gave Himself to God, and secondly, He gave Himself to others. And that's how you and I ought to give. We give ourselves to God. And by the way, when you give yourself to God, you'll have little problem with giving your substance to God. Notice the word willing is used over and over here. The word willing. They were willing. And that's a great word. It's used in verse number 3. 
It's used in verse 11. It's used in verse 12. It's used in verse 19. Willing, willing, willingness. When you and I can give ourselves to God, we're willing of ourselves to give ourselves to the Lord first. We won't have a problem giving our substance. We give ourselves to God. We give ourselves for others. That's important. It was motivated here by love. Now listen, what, what a strong rebu- rebuke this was to the church at Corinth. Because they'd gotten away from this kind of giving. They were so wrapped up in the gifts of the Spirit that they neglected the graces or the grace of the Spirit. They were so wrapped up in the gifts of the Spirit. Who's going to talk in tongues and who's going to do this or that or the other? And they... They got away from the, the grace of God. And so, when we give as Jesus gave. <coughs> Paul is not ordering them to give here, but he's giving advice. He's pointing out that the Macedonians were following the example of the, the, example of the Lord. They were poor, yet they gave. Jesus was poor, yet he gave. And so we see a great example there. Then... I want to give you a fourth thing tonight. You and I can practice, we can give God's way, number four, when we give willingly. And I know I'm a little redundant there. I just kind of gave, my, gave away my point a moment ago. But there's a great difference between promise and performance. Promise and performance. And that's what Paul is telling. What you promised to do a year ago, he said, do it. Perform but the, may there be a performing of that which you promised. They, Titus was there a year before, and, but they didn't keep their promise. Paul is, is appealing to their willingness to do what they ought to do and what they, have, what they set out to do. And I'll give you one more. My time is gone tonight. But It's giving God's way, number four, number five, and this is the last point, when we give by faith. When we give by faith. You say, well, Pastor, how can I know that, that I'm giving in the right spirit? How can I know that I'm giving with the right motives? How can I, lo- how can I know that I'm doing, that my stewardship is, is pleasing to God? When we give in spite of circumstances, when we give enthusiastically, joyfully, cheerfully, When we give as Jesus gave, God, others. When we give willingly. And number five, when we give by faith. And uh, Paul was not suggesting here that the rich become poor so that the poor might become rich. Uh, It's always unwise for a Christian to go into debt in order to relieve somebody else's debt, of course. But he's talking here about equality about all of God's people having a part in, 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 in obeying the Lord. Who does the equalizing? Well, God does. We understand that. Uh, Paul, Paul uses the miracle of the manna uh, to illustrate this principle in Exodus chapter 16, uh, verse 18. No matter how, how much manna the Jews gathered each day, they always had what they needed. They always had enough. If they tried to hoard the manna, they discovered it was impossible because it began to smell and rot. Exodus, Exodus chapter 16, verse 20. So there's a lesson here that Paul's trying to, to teach with the manna. Gather what you need, share what you can, but don't try to hoard God's blessings. God will see to it that your needs are met as we trust Him Day by day. God's provision in our life is a daily thing. Amen? A daily thing. The Bible says, as our days are, so shall our strength be. Uh, If I was writing that, I would have said, you know, as my strength is, so will my days be. (laughs) But God says, as your days are, so will your... I've got enough strength to help you through the day. I've got enough provision to help you through your needs. And that's what God is teaching here. And so we're, we're encouraged to give by faith. And notice how this church did this, and I'm, and I'm done. The Bible says, this they did. 
Notice uh, verse number 3. I'm sorry. For to their power, in other words, they gave from their resources, to, from their power, I bear record, record, yea, and beyond their power. So that's the two kinds of giving here. One is to their power. In other words, we give from what we have. We, we look at what we have and we give from our power, to our power. It doesn't require a whole lot of faith to do that, by the way. And there's nothing wrong with budgeting your finances, budgeting money. Nothing wrong with that. The scripture tells us we ought to count the cost. Before we go into battle, we ought to count the cost. But this idea of beyond our power, that's where we enter into faith giving, trusting God for what we don't have. Listen, faith is not giving based on how much I want to give to God. It's how much God wants to give through me. And that's what the church here was all about. They gave to their power, but they also gave beyond their power. Beyond their power. And <laughs> that's what faith promise giving is all about. It's trusting God to provide something supernaturally in your life. That, and then depending on God for that and exercising faith to trust God for that, and then uh, giving generously. God is not limited by what we don't have. Faith always picks up at the end of our ability, and it brings God into the picture. Faith picks up at the end of our ability and brings God into the picture. I remind you, I've said this before, but I'll give you this quote again, but the Christian life is not my responsibility. The Christian life is my response to His ability. It's my response to His ability. And God is able, as we live by faith, the just shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For him that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And that's how God wants us to live day by day. Diligently seeking Him, trusting Him, looking to His hand, and I think we ought to give both ways. I think there's, there's the idea that we can look at what we have and say, Lord, I want to give from my resources, from what I have. But Lord, I also want to enter in, I want to give from what I don't have. I want to trust you, Lord, to provide. And when you meet that provision, I'll be a channel uh, I'm not going to hoard God's blessings and build greater barns and say to myself, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And thou hast much goods laid up for many years. No. I'm going to live my Christian life with the thought of God and the thought of others and the thought of eternity. And when God does send an extra blessing your way, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it, boy, I can take some of this and I can be a blessing to my, to my church. That's the kind of giving that was practiced here in Macedonia. And so I review once again and I close. How can we give God's way? When we give in spite of circumstances. We learn from the widow of Zer Zerapath and we learn from the widow with the two mites. We are never too poor to give. Right? We're never too poor to give. We give in spite of circumstances. We give joyfully. We give as Jesus gave. We give willingly and we give by faith. And may those five things be principles that can guide all of us in our stewardship. Amen.